This is Harsh Rules, I'm Ben Harsh, and today we're going to learn to play Paths of Glory. Paths of Glory was released in 1999 by GMT Games and designed by Ted S. Racier. This game supports two players and takes eight hours to play. Since 1999, GMT Games has reprinted Paths of Glory six times. With all these printings, there are two versions of the game you may encounter. Versions with the original map art, as you see here, and in 2010, GMT released a deluxe version with a mounted board showing the classic map on one side, and the same map with all new art on the other. For this rules breakdown, I will be using the deluxe edition of the game. The new art has color-coded countries and other features which greatly aid setup and gameplay. So now that you've seen the map, you're probably wondering, how does this game work? Well, Paths of Glory is a World War I strategy war game with a point-to-point -point movement system. This means that instead of distinct territories or hexes, the map's geography is organized into a network of key location spaces connected by lines. These lines govern the transport of supplies, troop movement, and combat. While Paths of Glory may seem like it has hundreds of game spaces, there are actually only a few types. Let's reference the legend in the upper right hand corner of the game board to learn more. Each space is color coded with an affiliation to a particular side at the beginning of the game. Allied controlled spaces are tan, and central powers controlled spaces are gray. A space with a red border and a banner are locations worth victory points. Ultimately, control of an opponent's victory point spaces will enable them to win the game. Spaces may also have distinguishing terrain, such as deserts, swamps, mountains, and forests. There are also two unique spaces, invasion beaches and fort spaces. We will cover invasions and supply lines in a subsequent episode. Fort spaces are locations with built-in defenses. Fort spaces provide benefits for defenders and additional challenges for attackers. All these spaces are connected by lines that represent paths. A few of these lines are dotted with restrictions on movement for specific units. Movement and combat are all governed by the connections of each location by these lines. Now that we understand the layout of the map better, let's look at the game's units. Paths of Glory's main game pieces are double-sided cardboard chits called units. Units come in two sizes based on their type. Army units are identified by larger squares that represent up to 300,000 soldiers. Smaller squares are core units and represent forces of 20,000 to 50,000 soldiers. Both unit types share a common layout of key information. The unit's army identification is printed on the top of the marker. Army IDs show the unit's historical designation in World War I. Core units are not specifically called out and are essentially identical to each other. The two-letter abbreviation on the left side of the marker indicates the nation being represented. In this example, BR is the abbreviation for the British. Each nation's marker also has a distinct color that sets them apart. Three numbers run along the bottom of the marker. These numbers represent the unit's key gameplay stats. Starting from the left side of the marker, the first number is the combat factor. This is essentially the unit's strength in combat. The number in the middle is the loss factor. This stat is mainly used to depict the unit's health. The third and final number is the movement factor. This is the number of spaces a unit can move. Army and Corps units also share a regression path in their stages of health. When an Army unit absorbs damage equal to or greater than its loss factor, the marker is flipped over. Each time this happens, the unit steps down one level. A reduced unit's side is identified by a stripe through the middle. The reduced unit's stats may or may not be affected by this step loss. When a reduced army unit is damaged again, it is replaced with a core unit at full strength. 
Be aware, this can only be done if there is an available core unit in the reserve box. The army unit is removed and placed in the eliminated replaceable units box. Unless the unit is dotted, then it is removed from the game. Gameplay then resumes with the core unit. If the core unit is damaged, it is flipped over to its stripe side. And if it is damaged again, it is removed from the map and placed in the eliminated replaceable units box, unless it's dotted. Next, let's take a look at replacing units or restoring their strength. Now that we understand the layout of units and how their steps work, let's look at the overall play structure and how cards function. First, let's set the stage for card play. Each player begins the game by shuffling strategy cards numbered 1 through 14 into a starting deck. These cards are all titled Mobilization at the top. They then draw 7 cards to form their starting hand. The Central Powers player has the option to choose to start the game with the Guns of August strategy card in their hand. If they choose to do so, they have to let the Allied player know they've done this. Once each player has their starting hand, it's time to move on to the phases of gameplay. Paths of Glory is played over the course of 20 game turns from August 1914 to the winter of 1919. Each turn is organized into 8 phases. Phase 1 is for mandated offenses. In this phase, a die is rolled to determine if nations are forced to conduct combat, but let's skip this for now. This leads us to the heart of gameplay which occurs in Phase 2, the Action Phase. The Action Phase is composed of 6 action rounds, and yes, terms for this game are backwards from most war games. Here, rounds make up turns rather than the usual phrasing of turns making up game rounds. During each action round, starting with the Central Powers player, they have six options. The first four options are to play a strategy card for a game effect. The last two options are rare exceptions, so let's just focus on card play. Once the Central Powers player has resolved the effect of their played strategy card, the Allied player then gets to play a card and resolve its effects, and so on back and forth until all six action rounds are played through. And now that we're a little more familiar with the background, let's learn about the cards themselves and what actions can be played. Each strategy card has a consistent layout. The banner text at the top of the card indicates the war status this strategy card belongs to. There are three war statuses with their own sets of strategy cards. Mobilization, Limited War, and Total War. We will take a closer look at these in just a moment. Each card is also numbered for inventory purposes. The remaining portions of the card are for four of the game's actions. Paths of Glory is a card-driven game, also known as a CDG. In card-driven games, players can conduct different game actions by playing a card from their hand. These strategy cards can each be played to conduct one of four actions. A strategy card can be played for the first value in the upper left-hand corner for its operation value. The operation value provides the player with activation points, which can be used to activate spaces for either movement or to attack. The activation cost is based on the number of nationalities in each space. For example, this card could be used to activate two spaces with one nationality each, or a single space containing two nationalities. However, the overall operation can only be used to move or attack, not a mix of both between spaces. The second option is to play the strategy card for strategic redeployment, also referred to as SR. Strategic redeployment can be conducted in two ways. First, to move units long distances through friendly controlled territories. Strategically redeploying a core costs 1 SR, an army 4 SR. The second use is to SR a core unit from the reserve box. 
a core unit can be moved from the reserve box to any space containing a supplied unit of the same nationality. The third action option is to play the card for its event. Events are themed around World War I's history and can modify gameplay in a number of ways. Events are identified by name and often coded with several indicators. For example, an asterisk means the card is removed from gameplay after the event is resolved. If the name is underlined, this means that there is an event that must be played before this one can be played. Two capital C's mean this event is a combat card. If the event name is followed by a number in parentheses, playing the event increases that nation's war status by that many points. War status dictates the number of strategy cards a player can add to their active deck. The text below the title informs players the effect this event has on gameplay. Events are usually focused around special game effects, earning victory points, adding dice combat modifiers, also known as DRMs, bringing reinforcements onto the map, and allowing neutral nations to enter the war. Finally, the box at the bottom of the card can be played for reinforcement points. Reinforcement points can be used to bring reinforcements onto the board or rebuild damaged or lost units. Each abbreviation in the box represents a nation. For example, BR is British, FR French, and RU Russian. Next to each abbreviation are the reinforcement points awarded to each nation. These points can only be used by these nations to rebuild their own units. To understand more about the game's cards, victory conditions, and replacement points, let me draw your attention to the general records track in the lower left-hand corner of the game board. The general records track uses several markers to monitor each side's war status, their current victory status, and each nation's replacement points. Let's begin by discussing war status. Paths of Glory stages the addition of new strategy cards to a player's deck according to their war status. War status represents each side's commitment to the Great War. The Allied Powers and Central Powers each have their own war status marker that begins on Space Zero of the General Records track. This represents the mobilization level of commitment to the war with the initial 14 strategy cards. Whenever a strategy card is played for an event with a number in parentheses, that side's war status marker is increased that number of spaces. When a side's war status marker reaches the 4 space, then 20 limited war strategy cards are shuffled into the player's draw deck. And when a side's war status marker reaches the 11 space, then the remaining 21 total war strategy cards are shuffled in as well. Now, there is also a third marker for the combined war status. This marker's position on the track is updated every time either side's war status marker moves up. This marker tracks two additional record spaces. When the combined war status marker reaches space 30, the Zimmerman telegram event can be played. This begins the U.S. process of entering the war and the Russians leaving the war. Both of these are multi-step events we will cover in a subsequent episode. Finally, if the combined war status marker reaches space 40, an armistice is declared and victory is determined. More about this in a subsequent episode. Now, let's discuss how most games are resolved. The status of either side winning the war is tracked by the victory points marker. The VP marker begins on the 10 space. It is then pulled back and forth by each side. The allied player scores negative victory points that reduce the marker on the number track and if it reaches zero, they win the game. The central powers score positive victory points that increase the VP marker and if it reaches 20, they win the game. Most victory points can be scored by the following methods. Capturing or recapturing enemy VP spaces. These VP spaces can be identified on the game board by their red banner. Playing specific strategy cards for their events. And failing to conduct a mandated offensive. 
These are the main ones. There are also several situational VPs awarded based on blockades, peace terms and offensives, Italian neutrality, French mutinies, etc. All these opportunities are listed on the game's reference sheet. Finally, let's discuss tracking replacement points. Replacement points are earned by playing a strategy card for the box at the bottom. Each nation's replacement points are then tracked with its own specific marker. At the beginning of the game, the Allied powers have replacement point markers for Britain, France, and Russia, as well as an Allied marker for minor Allied powers. Replacement points for these nations are marked with an A. For the Central Powers, they begin the game with markers for Germany and Austria-Hungary. Every game turn, each nation's replacement marker starts on space zero. During the action phase, strategy cards can be spent for replacement points to advance these markers. Later, during the replacement phase, replacement points can be spent. However, any replacement points not spent during this phase are lost. And after that, all markers are reset to the zero space again. Later in the game, other nations will enter the war. On the Allied side, this includes Italy and the United States. For the Central Powers, this is Bulgaria and Turkey. These markers begin every turn on the zero space. Neutral nations enter the game in a number of ways. Several neutral nations can be brought into the game by playing an event card. However, keep in mind that only one neutral entry event card can be played per turn. As we saw earlier, the United States has its own path to entering the war. Turkey enters the war once the Central Powers War Status Marker reaches Space 4, Limited War. Paths of Glory has a complex replacement system for building back troop strength and redeploying defeated units to the game map. Let's begin with the normal unit step cycle that represents forces on the game map. During the replacement phase, replacement points, also known as RPs, can be spent to build up a unit's strength. One RP can be spent to build a reduced strength army back to full strength and one RP can be spent to rebuild two reduced strength core units back to full strength. Let's move on now to discuss units that have been placed in the Eliminated Replaceable Units box. Eligible Eliminated Army and Core Units follow different paths out of this box. Let's first look at Army Units. Players can spend RPs to rebuild Army Units and place them back on the game board. One RP to bring back an Army Unit at Reduced Strength and two points to bring an Army Unit back at Full Strength. When units are brought back, they appear at either their nation's capital or a supply center. Now let's look at eliminated core units. When core units are rebuilt, they are moved to the reserve box where they re-enter the game by way of strategic redeployment. It costs 1 RP to move 2 reduced strength core units and 1 RP to move 1 full strength core to the reserve box. A quick note, 1 RP can also be split by building up one core from reduced strength to full strength and moving a reduced strength core from the eliminated box to the reserve box. These costs and several exceptions to these rules can be found on the game's reference sheet. One final visual before we close out this episode. This one shows each side's capitals as well as their supply sources. When a nation adds reinforcements by playing a strategy card for its event, rebuilding armies from the eliminated box, or moving core units from the reserve box, they are placed at each of their nation's respective locations. Also remember that core units strategically redeployed from the reserve box can be placed in any space containing a supply unit of the same nationality. Keep these areas in mind when managing your forces. Hopefully, this first episode has given you an understanding of the overlying game mechanics of Paths of Glory. In the next episode, we're going to focus in on unit movement and combat. If you found this video helpful, please give me a like and share with your friends. 
To be the first notified when the next episode of Harsh Rules becomes available, please hit the bell icon for notifications. And as always, this is Ben Harsh for Harsh Rules. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you on the next video.